you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to um, be here uh, in Paris to address uh, an audience as diverse as, uh, as this one. Um, I've um, greatly enjoyed the, the set of talks that I've seen over the past week and thank the organizers for uh, scheduling my talk almost at the last minute of this conference so that I could benefit from the others and also have time to prepare my talk. So it's very, um, uh, very nice. So I'm going to um, talk about a, uh, uh, a method which um, we, we're calling Terra Lasso, uh, which is a, a generalization of graphical lasso um, and um, so putting it in the context of time varying uh, spatial um, temporal uh, processes. Um, and so uh, I'll first give a little bit of motivation for this uh, uh, type of, of modeling. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, uh, the, the basic um, underpinnings of the model, which are chronic representations of the covariance and the inverse covariance, and then introduce this uh, tensor graphical lasso or terra lasso is what I was describing. Um, these, uh, uh, everything I'm talking about uh, can be um, uh, more developed in more detail uh, at your convenience uh, from our paper that we submitted uh, to a journal and, and his own archive. So before I get started here, I want to just show as a, as a motivation um, this uh, type of, uh, of, of application, which we've been involved in in the past uh, uh, year or two. It's uh, uh, the motivation uh, is to basically track sunspots uh, called active regions uh, across the sun. And uh, the objective being to be able to predict when these, uh, these active regions, these sunspots, uh, may be um, uh, uh, likely to become uh, uh, solar flares or coronal mass ejections. And so these ejections can be very uh, um, uh, dangerous, risky, uh, risking for the uh, uh, for the Earth's atmosphere, as they can perturb um, the magnetic field, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, millions of, of, of kilometers away from from where they, they occur. So the problem here then is to build a predictor, right? Both uh, in terms of modeling uh, this uh, spatio-temporal process of these sunspots, and uh, then building a predictor which can have the capability of predicting some hours or maybe even days before that a particular uh, active region is going to become a coronal mass ejection event. Um, and that can uh, then uh, provide some, some early warning, if you like, to, um, uh, to us on Earth about uh, potentially dis disturbing um, electromagnetic uh, 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 interference. So uh, this is an application that I'm not going to talk any more about. We're, we're working on this, um, uh, and probably next, next year I'll have more to say about it. Uh, another application that um, I also won't talk about, but uh, that uh, is, is motivational, is synthetic aperture radar um, imaging, uh, for which uh, one has a, forms a reference image from a, um, uh, a space-time adaptive processing uh, over uh, both range uh, and over pulse. Uh, and so pulse effectively gives you um, uh, replicates uh, of a range, a range bin uh, that is some cell out at some range from the, um, uh, from the radar that then uh, you can uh, form images like this by looking at the returns at various uh, 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 gated, time gated uh, pulse return um, uh, selected uh, range bins uh, to, to form these types of of images, and one of the main issues in, um, uh, in this type of, of imaging modality is getting uh, or reducing clutter. So clutter suppression, there's a lot of clutter that you can see here that's this sort of corpuscular uh, noise uh, uh, patterns. These are uh, patterns of uh, objects that are at um, 
uh, very, have various uh, Doppler uh, signatures. And so um, uh, applying a clutter rejection or clutter suppression method uh, that, that's, that's uh, based on uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about here, Kronecker uh, representations for the covariance, can clean up the image and get you nice clean uh, tracks, if you like, through, through the Doppler space. Um, and so uh, how, does these, how do these clutter methods work? Well, they basically form from each uh, region uh, in, in the image at various uh, uh, pulses, they're replicates, if you like, a, um, uh, a vector which characterizes uh, one range bin, uh, so one spatial uh, temporal range bin, and then um, uh, you average over the, the pulses in order to form a covariance matrix uh, from the outer product of these, of these vectors. And that gives you, uh, if you form that over some region which is potentially only clutter, clutter alone, no, no signal, uh, then uh, you can estimate the clutter. And assuming the clutter is spatially uh, and temporally stationary, you can then apply uh, that uh, covariance estimate to um, basically declutter or denoising uh, using a variety of techniques, uh, least squares or um, Kapan um, uh, uh, eigenspace uh, projection methods or what have you. So the critical thing here is estimating that covariance, right? And the difficulty is that you may not have many pulses to do so in these types of, of, of systems. You want to minimize the number of pulses so that you have a, a better slew rate, right? Higher spatial resolution. Uh, so if you're going to, if you're going to allocate uh, more of your computation and um, time resources to generating more pulses, that is, more samples to form a, a, a better, higher quality covariance estimate, well, then you're going to lose on resolution for a fixed budget of, uh, uh, of time or, or, um, or resources. So that leads to the issue of uh, coming up with ways to estimate the covariance, or what turns out to be most important here is the inverse covariance in terms of clutter suppression and in terms of modeling, as I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, in, uh, that, that's parsimonious, that we can get away with few samples, few pulses, uh, and still come up with an accurate uh, uh, sparse estimate uh, uh, in some space, maybe in the natural space of the, uh, of the elements of the matrix, the covariance matrix, or maybe in some basis. All right, so uh, let's, let's talk about uh, then this in, in, a, in a more concrete way. What we have is a multi-index data array, the general problem, right, spatial temporal process problem, where the indices I1 through IK index over various domains. So for example, if K is equal to uh, 3, I1 could be uh, the, the X coordinate, I2 could be the Y coordinate, and then I3 could be time, right, for a, for a spatial temporal image uh, um, uh, application. Uh, or if, if k equals 4, you could add, for example, wavelength to, to that, right? So you'll, we have this multiple indexed um, uh, data array. And of course, you can flatten the array and forget about all the indexing, but then you lose the intrinsic physical properties of spatial proximity, temporal proximity, wavelength proximity, uh, having some structure, some intrinsic structure. So you want to improve, you want to, if you want to preserve that structure, you want to preserve the patterning in, this, uh, in this, this data array that's induced by these indices. And this is what we're going to exploit in these Kronecker type models that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, so there are k uh, different index sets. Uh, each index set has a range from 1 to d i, so i equals 1 to k. The total number of dimensions, total number of variables, right? Uh, that we're dealing with in this array is uh, D is the product of all of these uh, dimension um, DI uh, uh, index cardinality, um, right? And uh, this is going to be an important quantity. MK is like the co-dimension of one of the index uh, domains, uh, the kth one, which is simply the product excluding the kth domain of all the other uh, dimensions in all other domains. And that's going to become important in terms of uh, looking at the, uh, the, these Kronecker methods uh, improvement in terms of covariance estimation and inverse covariance estimation. Uh, we're going to see that this is uh, the, uh, a factor of improvement. 
right? So mk can be very large for large dimensions, large k. And that's where our methods are going to become um, quite important. So the common traits in these uh, types of problems is the, the, of, of spatiotemporal imaging, the type that I've presented before, highly uh, uh, high dimension. Uh, the arrays are, are complex, lots of noise and high variability structure. Uh, and the domains have different types. So we, have, we, we should consider them separately. Um, and the, the, the other thing I want to emphasize here is that we're dealing with predictive models. We want to develop models that are capable of predicting ahead. So first order models are not sufficient. You have to, you have, to have some notion of correlation in order to do prediction, right? So uh, we require the covariance and that's, that's why we're going to focus solely on covariance in this, in this context. So let's look at the covariance. So here's our z for two dimensions. Maybe d1 is a, is a spatial dimension, d2 is a time dimension. Um, and if you vectorize this, uh, this array, uh, and uh, this is a, a single epoch, an epoch is, is look at it as a pulse, a, 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 an independent snapshot, right, of this uh, array. Um, uh, you vectorize that into this d1 times d2, which we call d, as in the previous uh, slide, uh, a vector. And then the covariance of this vector, uh, which is the expectation, assuming zero mean, of the vector times this vector transpose is a d by d matrix, d equals d1 times d2. And uh, it has this nice patterning structure, this tiling structure, where if, as I said, this d1 is space and d2 is time, you get these different temporal correlation uh, uh, spatial uh, patches of correlation. So this would be, uh, you know, at the, the correlated, correlated spatial patch between time two and time uh, uh, four, right, in this example where we have uh, five time uh, instants. So this patterning is something that exists in the matrix and we can exploit it. We're going to exploit this because this type of patterning is precisely what the Kronecker type of, of methods uh, will deliver. In, in fact, if you just look at a Kronecker pot product representation of this matrix uh, with two uh, Kronecker product uh, uh, factors, then um, you get a replication of, of this, exactly this type, but where each one of these spatial uh, patches has identical structure ex up to a scale factor, right? So that's, that's of course a simplification and a approximation to the model. So um, in terms of modeling this mathematically so that we can build a, um, uh, a inference procedure for estimating uh, these uh, covariances uh, that have this type of, of structure. Um, uh, we look at, again, a set of samples or, or pulses uh, in the uh, STAP or SAR radar case where n of these, we have d uh, dimensional vector uh, at each uh, sample time. That's the vectorization of this, of this uh, uh, matrix. And um, we assume that these are independent, identically distributed uh, uh, pulse or, or samples uh, with each, co each column has a covariance matrix sigma. And the sample covariance matrix can be formed simply by taking this outer product after you subtract the mean, uh, sample mean, um, and uh, uh, summing over n, over i, excuse me, the, uh, the, the index over the, over the columns, over the independent snapshots and then dividing by the degrees of freedom, right, n minus one, which can also be uh, represented as, as a projection, right, right a geometric uh, projection uh, onto the, uh, the complement uh, of the diagonal of the n-dimensional space. So um, in this context, uh, we can write down a model. So a Gaussian model is one that comes to mind. If you're dealing with covariance, it's probably, arguably, the simplest covariance model. Um, or, or simplest uh, statistical model for uh, uh, an array of, of random variables uh, with a uh, specified covariance on the columns. And so this is the form of the log of the multivariate uh, Gaussian or normal distribution, uh, which involves uh, the inverse of the covariance that's determined, log determinant, uh, the um, uh, trace of the inverse covariance times the sample covariance. And so the maximum likelihood covariance estimator would be, uh, could be posed as, as, uh, as 
basically minimizing the negative log uh, likelihood uh, over the set of sigma inverses, which I call omega here. Omega, uh, uh, so omega is sigma inverse, the precision matrix, as it's called. Uh, and so this is a convex optimization. Um, and uh, there are on the order of uh, d squared unknown parameters, right? The elements of the, the d times d plus 1 over 2 uh, uh, elements of the covariance matrix of dimension d. Um, and we have some, some requirements, some basic requirements, which are very restrictive when d is large uh, because it requires n to be extremely large, the number of samples, the number of pulses, right? So uh, even for existence, we require, uh, without any further conditions uh, constraining omega to some, some lower dimensional space, uh, we need at least order of d, right, uh, measurements which is the product, right, of a k-fold product of all of the uh, underlying dimensions in space, time, and wavelength, and so forth. Um, and uh, more, uh, more precisely, uh, even if, if n is greater than d, it should be of order d squared to be accurate in terms here of Frobenius norm, but the, a similar um, uh, analysis holds for, for other, other norms, matrix norms of the uh, of the error, the error residual between an estimate sigma hat and sigma on the order of d squared over n. So um, if we, have, on the other hand, have structure, uh, so uh, for sparse example uh, of, of, the, of a precision matrix, so many of the elements are zero, then it's possible to reduce this uh, requirement of n greater than or equal to on the order of d squared um, snapshots, independent snapshots, to on the order of linear in D, right? And that's the, the, the feature that's exploited by the uh, graphical lasso uh, uh, that uh, now adds a penalty function, a L1 uh, relaxation of the L0 um, uh, uh, counting uh, uh, norm and uh, then uh, we, we have an op we have uh, we retain a convex optimization uh, in omega. So there's lots of other types of covariance uh, and inverse covariance uh, uh, structural um, uh, assumptions that can be imposed, and lots of work on uh, how to estimate that structure either in the covariance domain or the inverse covariance domain. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but this sort of just you know gives a, a snapshot of. Uh, some of the work that's, that's been out there, including, including our own work um, in um, uh, sparse Kronecker uh, Gauss graphical models uh, that uh, uh, was uh, independently uh, uh, derived uh, by us and, um, and Alan and, and, and Rob Chipcharani. So um, with sparsity, you basically have patterning, right, of the covariance or the inverse covariance. And patterning uh, in terms of the elements of the inverse covariance, let's just focus on that, uh, that, uh, that are not zero, right? So what these, these boxes here. The zero elements um, uh, give you a reduction in dimension because you, you know you're imposing that they're zero in beforehand. Um, and with a sparse uh, a penalty, you're not actually choosing the locations where they're zero, but you're, you're saying that there's a a number of these that are zero controlled by the, uh, the value of that regularization parameter uh, that uh, uh, is, is lambda here. Um, and so these can each be, be described equivalently as a graphical model where an edge exists uh, between two uh, variables, one and two, for example, um, if, uh, the, uh, if there's a correlation between them or an inverse correlation uh, greater than zero. That, that links them, and, um, and so you see that in this block model, you, a graphical model is basically separated into two cliques, uh, uh, two graphs which have uh, no uh, common, uh, no edges between them, uh, but there are other models like tree-based models or uh, conditionally uh, block uh, diagonal models where if you condition on variable three that you separate one, two, and four, and five, or Markov chain models, tridiagonal types of structures, uh, pentadiagonal structures, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I'm just introducing this because we're going to talk a little bit about graphical models in this context as a simple way of sort of summarizing dependency structures uh, between variables. So for example, in this, ex in, in this uh, chain, uh, three depends 
on one only through two. So it's a Markovian uh, structure. Um, so uh, there's two types of, of sparsity domains that we could, we could work with, sparse in correlation or sparse in inverse correlation, um, and which is the graphical model um, uh, domain, if you like. Um, and um, uh, sometimes the inverse and the, and, the, uh, and the correlation matrix itself are both sparse, for example, in the block diagonal case, but often only one of them is. And it, uh, an example I like to give uh, it, to sort of motivate why the inverse covariance is so fundamental uh, is uh, considering physical processes. Uh, and if you con consider, for example, a process Z over the plane x, y and a function of time that uh, it, it obeys a Poisson equation, so you know, heat, heat equation uh, uh, or electromagnetic uh, uh, propagation equation driven by a um, uh, a, a Brownian motion or white noise, W of T, um, then if you discretize this using an Euler approximation for small uh, discretization parameters, then you get um, a recursive definition of uh, the, the, the variable, Zij, in terms of its neighbors in two dimensions, so the I plus one and I minus one location for a fixed uh, 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 column location, uh, and then uh, corresponding fixed row location and the nearest neighbors in, in, um, in column space, and then still, of course, driven by this noise. If you put this in a matrix form by just iterating over the ij, uh, then defi defining a matrix A, which uh, captures the fact that we have this nearest neighbor dependency, um, then um, uh, in, in this uh, discrete Euler approximation to, the, uh, to this Poisson equation, then this is equivalent to this uh, uh, vector uh, matrix equation, um, which then, uh, if you take the covariance of both sides, you see that the inverse covariance of x is proportional to the, um, the square of i minus a, and a is sparse, right, because it only captures nearest neighbors. So the inverse covariance is sparse. The covariance matrix in this case is not necessarily sparse, right? Um, and so this is a, a pentadiagonal matrix showing here, this is a, 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 the, the form of that matrix for this type of nearest neighbor dependency where uh, a point ij uh, only uh, really uh, depends upon, in terms of the Poisson discretization, its nearest neighbor points. So the, the, the inverse covariance is fundamental, right, in physical processes. Any process that has this sort of implicit uh, ODE or PDE structure is uh, going to be um, described in its natural sparse domain by the co inverse covariance, not by the covariance itself. And that's just a realization. So let's go back to this picture and, and uh, talk again about um, uh, the inverse covariance uh, and a chronic -a product model. So as I said before, um, if you assume uh, a, um, a simple chronic -a product, uh, that uh, co vector, the covariance of z is equal to a chronic or b, for example, um, then that's going to populate each one of these patches in this tiling of the, co of the inverse covariance, uh, or the covariance in this case, um, uh, in this form. So as I said, you have the, uh, the, the second factor b, which is replicated p times around the matrix uh, with different scale factors. So this sort of uh, uh, embeds the, um, uh, the, the second factor, the right factor in the Kronecker product into the matrix in a highly uh, uh, regular fashion, right? And, uh, uh, and, and, and preserves uh, degrees of freedom, uh, or I should say, reduces degrees of freedom drastically relative to the unconstrained case. Kronecker products have very nice properties uh, that uh, you know, positive definiteness is preserved in the Kronecker product. The inverse is preserved in the Kronecker product. The determinant is preserved in the Kronecker product. Uh, and uh, this, this is not relevant to this discussion, but the Kronecker products have very, uh, uh, very nice uh, 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 algorithms for uh, solving linear equations uh, that, um, that can be uh, exploited using this type of, of argument, uh, permutation or rearrangement operator type of argument. And then there's this property here, which says that uh, if you have a chronic product and you look at its uh, 
uh, its square uh, by taking the transpose on the right-hand side, that that also is preserved in the, in the uh, factor space. And this, is, this, this leads to a stochastic representation. So if the inverse covariance has this form A chronicer B for some A and B that are compatible, so let's say this is a, a I'm saying D1 and D2 or P and Q in this case, uh, and they're positive definite matrices, then if you define the square root factors of uh, uh, C and D of A and B, which exist because of positive definiteness, uh, then uh, you can represent Z explicitly as this, uh, this, this Brownian motion process uh, uh, pre and post multiplied by C inverse and D inverse. So very nice uh, uh, generative model, right, that, that can be used to generate these types of Kronecker processes from uh, Gaussian or arbitrary uh, uh, isotropic uh, uh, matrices W. So just an example, Kronecker product model uh, for the inverse covariance that uh, is a Kronecker product of uh, a three by three and a six by six matrix um, is, uh, is gonna lead to an 18 by 18 covariance matrix, uh, 153 unknown parameters, D times D plus one over two, um, and the Kronecker product model um, reduces 153 unknown parameters to the number of free parameters in these two matrices, which is only 18, right? So um, you get a, a, a big gain by Kronecker product representation. You get even a bigger gain if you assume sparsity in the Kronecker's, in the Kronecker products. So just assume a tridiagonal structure, then um, you reduce the number of parameters from 153 to only seven. Uh, seven parameters uh, in, this, in this case, uh, in terms of the off-diagonals. I haven't counted the diagonals in this, uh, in this calculation. So a, a major decrease in the number of degrees of freedom, meaning that uh, it's also a major relaxation in the number of samples, independent samples that we're gonna need, the number of epochs, right, that we need in order to accurately estimate this, uh, this covariance um, in the model. So uh, the, um, Sparse uh, matrix variant normal model, um, which uh, uh, uses this type of representation, um, uh, simply uh, exchanges the omega in the equation I gave you before for the uh, inverse log likelihood with A cross B, that A chronic or B, uh, with uh, sparsity penalties on A and B. Um, and um, uh, this uh, can be uh, uh, minimized. Uh, however, it's not convex, right? Obviously not convex, it's, it's bilinear, right? So if you fix B, it's convex in A and, and vice versa, but it's not convex in A and B. And that leads to the KG Lasso uh, uh, algorithm, and I'll just show a very quick example of this uh, so that uh, to, to, to set, set the, uh, the stage. Uh, here we took some, some data from the National um, Climate uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, agency at, at NCEP, uh, uh, and uh, from this is a, a wedge of weather data, wind speed data from uh, the North Pole all the way down to upper upper Sweden. Um, and so we took a, a 10 by 10 spatial grid on these uh, uh, these these coordinate spherical coordinate space uh, for 100 spatial uh, uh, variables. And, uh, a two-day time window, there's, uh, in this NCEP data set, uh, there's uh, uh, four samples per day. And then over a period of 2003 to 2007, we have 224 samples. Now, they're arguably not uh, independent or identically distributed, but we're going to assume that they are for this uh, case. Here's wind speed um, in the meridional um, direction uh, for uh, longitude and latitude. Uh, you can see that there's, there's some obvious correlation structure uh, over, over time um, and space. So uh, one thing you can do is you can look at the Kronecker spectrum. So it, it turns out one property I didn't talk about before is that uh, the Pitsianis and Van Loan um, theory tells you that uh, any matrix can be approximated by a sufficiently large sum of Kronecker products. So, uh, you, can you can define a Kronecker spectrum this way and uh, compare it to the ordinary eigenspectrum um, of the um, uh, sample covariance matrix, and you can see that the Kronecker spectrum concentrates uh, in basically a single component. 91% of all the uh, residual 
uh, of all the uh, uh, descriptive power uh, in, in describing the Frobenius norm, the, uh, uh, the uh, covariance, uh, sample covariance, 91% uh, is contained in the first component. Whereas to get that same 91%, you'd have to, to go down to the fifth or sixth component in the eigenspectrum. So this is, this is good news. It tells us the, that the structure of the data is probably ripe for, for applying a, a Kronecker a product type of, of, of spectral, uh, a pro, excuse me, Kronecker product uh, type of, of, of estimator of the uh, covariance. Uh, and, and so this, uh, this shows the sample covariance matrix without any structure. Here's the Kronecker product approximation, which has preserved a lot of the structure and denoised the rest um, with a, a right factor, which is spatial, and a left factor, which is temporal, with the uh, expected uh, correlation occurring near the North Pole, where the number of grid points gets very uh, close together, right? So you naturally get more spatial correlation up near the North Pole, which is up uh, at, the, at the end of the, um, uh, the vector uh, lexicographic ordering that we used in this um, rendering. And then you can use this for prediction, which is what I motivated uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this whole talk ab about. So you can use the ordinary least squares predictor uh, on a min norm, more Penrose inverse of the rank deficient uh, uh, covariance matrix. Um, or you can use the uh, Kronecker product approximation. And you can see the Kronecker product approximation gives uh, in, in green, better residuals in terms of the prediction error, which you would expect because it does so well in denoising the covariance. Right? All right, so that's, that's um, the uh, uh, K, uh, uh, that, that's the, the, excuse me, that's the Kronecker lasso. Now, what, what about the Terra lasso? That's what uh, we, we're going to talk about next as a alternative representation for the inverse covariance. Instead of a uh, a nonlinear or bilinear representation, which is A Kronecker B, we have a Kronecker sum representation, which is linear in A and B. And so you have a left uh, 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 factor and a right factor that are added together uh, that are uh, in, in correspondence with A Kronecker and B Kronecker that are both the identity. So uh, this uh, leads to a, um, a model which has this uh, uh, the structure which still retains the same number of parameters, right, the, the number of elements in A and B that are, that are distinct, uh, but it's now linear in A and B. And that means that uh, when we plug this into the uh, form for the negative log likelihood, we're going to have a convex problem. That's a big advantage. Uh, and so uh, the Kronecker sum uh, has, has been used for k equal 2 for covariance estimation, precision based estimation, they're called the big lasso, uh, for also for k equals 2. And what we're, what we're uh, proposing here is a generalization to uh, uh, an arbitrary number, that should be k, not p, uh, uh, components in the uh, Kronecker sum uh, representation. So the Kronecker sum has properties, just like the Kronecker product. They're not quite as, as um, as nice, I mean, there's some standard properties, associativity, linearity, distributivity, and so forth, Lange decomposition. But uh, we, don't, we don't have, for example, the, this, these nice invariances, these inherited properties of inverses and determinants and so forth. Um, and so that, uh, that, that makes the, the geometric structure of these Kronecker sums a little more um, uh, challenging to, uh, to understand. Uh, but one thing you can see very easily that from this graphical representation that, of, of the covariance, the sparse covariance that I mentioned a minute ago, is that the Kronecker sum uh, gives a much more controllable um, uh, uh, increase in uh, uh, model uh, sparsity than uh, the uh, Kronecker product. And the Kronecker product, recall, we replicated uh, the leftmost, uh, excuse me, the rightmost uh, matrix factor all across the matrix. This is a, a, th a third order uh, product, but in the second order product, B A Kronecker B, and it replicates B all across the matrix. Whereas in this Kronecker sum, you don't get that replication property because you don't have that, uh, uh, that multiplicative uh, uh, magnification, right, of, of the uh, factor B. Uh, you have an additive uh, uh, amplification, if you like, right? And so you get a much sparser and more, uh, arguably more, uh, controllable um, uh, ability to control the um, 
the, the edges in this graph, that is, the, the, where, the, where the zeros occur in the covariance. So the Terra lasso is simply plugging in this uh, representation uh, to, uh, with a penalty, a sparsity penalty up here, where you see this MK appearing because each, each one of these factors uh, uh, contributes to the inverse covariance uh, through all the other dimensions, because we have all these other identities, right, that are in the, um, uh, in, in the Kronecker sum uh, representation. Uh, for a third order Kronecker product, uh, you'll have you know, A, B, and C as the, um, as, as the model parameters, and each one of those will be multiplied uh, by um, two identity matrices, right? So um, the MK characterizes the dimensions of those, those identity matrices and therefore characterizes the contribution of each one of these components into the objective function. And uh, then uh, we have an optimization that optimiz optimizes over this uh, linear space uh, of um, uh, A, B, C, or here psi 1 through psi k, uh, that is the positive cone over Kronecker sum uh, uh, representations. And we have a, a statistical convergence rate uh, which uh, indicates just the degree to which if you have no bias, right, so the, so the, the uh, inverse covariance actually has a Kronecker sum representation, you get this, uh, uh, this factor of uh, the minimum of or all dimensions k of the co-dimension quantity mk, which can be quite large, right, so the remaining uh, dimensions multiplied together, um, uh, that uh, uh, corresponds to a decrease in the Frobenius norm error relative to the G lasso, where you get essentially the same expression, uh, different uh, leading terms, um, uh, but without this min k mk. And uh, S is the sparsity factor, D is the overall dimension, uh, and then capital K is this uh, number of factors that we're using. So you get statistical convergence rates that are faster by this, this potentially very large factor, especially uh, when you have uh, uh, index, uh, multiple indexing over uh, a high dimensional index space. So one of the, one of the, the properties of this, uh, uh, this, this method is that uh, uh, there's uh, also a speed up with respect to uh, the uh, uh, the standard uh, G lasso and the by G lasso, the big lasso as it's so-called, which is the Terra lasso for k equals 2, using a um, iterative thresholding uh, algorithm uh, that uh, we get a speed up on the order of um, uh, the sum of dk cubed as, a sum, as opposed to the product of dk cubed for G lasso, simply because of this linearity uh, property uh, and uh, the use of, uh, of, a, of an ISTA type of algorithm. So I'm just going to show, as, uh, as I conclude here, uh, an example, from, again, from the um, National Center for Environmental Prediction, uh, wind speed data uh, over two parts of the U.S., in this case, the western U.S. and the, the eastern U.S., a 10 by 20 uh, a grid in this case. So we'll have 200 spatial components. Uh, we're going to have um, uh, five uh, temporal components, I believe. Uh, it's not marked here, but I think that's what we used. Uh, we use uh, 50 uh, snapshots, different, um, different epochs, right, of this 5 by 200, uh, 5 times 200, 1,000 uh, by 1,000 matrix. Um, uh, that's the covariance. And then this is what we get for, in terms of estimates of latitude and longitude, uh, which are the, uh, we, there's k, k equals, uh, uh, right, 10, 10 and 20 here. And this is just the, this is without time, sorry. This is without any time uh, component. Uh, you get these, these types of left and right factors with um, a corresponding uh, uh, break in the um, graph, excuse me, the graphical model uh, that occurs at, the, uh, at this point here, which is the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains breaks the weather patterns in the eastern and western part of the United States. And we see that coming out in this um, uh, Terra Lasso uh, estimate. Now, if you put time into the picture, um, then um, uh, you, we, we, which we'll do in a second, uh, then we can start talking about temporal, spatial temporal trends and uh, looking at seasonal variations, uh, predicting uh, those seasonal variations. In fact, what, what we are going to show and in the next slide is uh, uh, predicting uh, the season. So you can see that there's this sort of uh, uh, effect 
of uh, reduction of variance over the summer uh, as opposed to the, the, the uh, early spring and, and early winter months over the day of the year. This is averaged over the full um, 250 samples, so over about 15 years worth of data, uh, and over all of the, um, the grid points in the uh, eastern and western United States. So we can start talking about being able to detect from the spatial temporal covariance uh, representation or inverse uh, covariance representation that's estimated from the Terra Lasso, whether we can use that to predict the season at which a particular sample was collected. And the sample here corresponds to five days, um, 20 by 10 um, uh, vector of measurements. Uh, and so we show here that uh, over um, uh, in the bottom here, this is for time equals number of time points equals five, that uh, effectively uh, in these types, in this model, we can um, uh, estimate accurately the, um, the season uh, down to uh, uh, almost uh, error rate of zero uh, with very few samples using this Terra Lasso type of method uh, as contrasted to the, uh, uh, to the Kronecker uh, uh, G Lasso method. So um, conclusion uh, is that uh, this representation is very useful, I think, for uh, multi-indexed arrays. The Kronecker uh, product and the Kronecker sum both have their niches. Uh, the Kronecker uh, uh, product model uh, has uh, this uh, complexity uh, reduction, but the uh, Kronecker sum model has an even uh, higher uh, complexity, uh, computational complexity reduction because of the convexity of the uh, objective function, linear convexity of that of the log um, objective function. And now um, uh, one can ask, is there a stochastic representation for uh, Kronecker sum covariance, just like there's a stochastic representation for Kronecker product, right? Natural question. If you want to generate samples from this model, how can you do it? And can you do it efficiently? Um, so um, uh, the answer to this is an open problem. We don't know the answer. So I throw this out to you um, as, a, uh, as an open problem. Uh, we do have a, a kind of partial answer to this, uh, but that's, that requires uh, formulating the uh, problem is not estimating the uh, inverse covariance, but estimating the square root of the inverse covariance. And so uh, this, uh, you, can, you can see if the, if the inverse covariance omega was A Kronecker sum B squared, uh, then uh, if X is a uh, random matrix that, that satisfies this Sylvester equation for A and B multiplying on the left and the right, driven by this, again, this uh, isotropic uh, matrix uh, noise factor, then uh, X necessarily has a covariance of this type, an inverse covariance of this type. So uh, how do we transform this to a description on Z uh, that's uh, feasible uh, and, and uh, uh, parsimonious like this? That's open. So um, I'll just conclude by uh, plugging our journal, uh, the uh, new journal on uh, mathematics and data science, not that new anymore, it's been out about a year. First issue came out, came out uh, about uh, two months ago, um, and I'm one of the section editors. Uh, we are not competing against cyan image science, uh, but uh, we are looking for papers that uh, address general uh, data science uh, questions that might go, might, might include image uh, uh, applications but uh, that, that go beyond it into things like privacy and uh, representations of, uh, of, of high dimensional data sets and so forth. So with that, I'll stop. It's perfectly on time, so we have time for questions. So these two uh, models, Kronecker product and Kronecker sum, maybe your last question, maybe the clue to this answer is when should one apply which one? Yeah. I mean, right. you have data, like your atmospheric data or something. When is one more natural than other? Maybe it's the generative model that gives the clue? 
that's the and that's why this open question is so important. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, there's there are if if I go back to this um, generative model uh, for the Kronecker sum, this Sylvester equation is um, equation that's that's ubiquitous to a lot of of, of uh, physical processes. Yeah. And so, um, you know, maybe what we have to do is we have to develop a new theory for estimating the square of a Kronecker sum, right? Which we haven't done. We, we, our models are for the Kronecker sum itself, but now we're back to a non-convex uh, problem, right? So, um, the, the, lots of interesting directions here. Yeah, I mean, you could, uh, you could, you could replace the square using, uh, you know, a standard uh, you know, var variable, uh, auxiliary variable type of argument, estimate the square, then try to estimate the square root, which would require a Kolesky factorization, and the Kolesky factorization of uh, A chronic or product B is very easy. Uh, Kolesky factorization of A chronic or sum B is not. Don't forget the chronic or sum can have huge dimension, right? And the whole point of these, re these models is to be able to reduce that dimension by uh, representation through a much lower dimensional matrix uh, uh, pair or, or trio. So um, we don't know how to do it. And I'm throwing it out as an open problem. Can I a question on my left? So for the two models, uh, so Kronecker product and Kronecker sum, do you have equivalent of a Tracy Widom uh, or a Wigner law when you increase the size of the matrices? Uh, is it known or is it simple to, to prove? Uh, so there have been some, some uh, work in that direction. Uh, so the uh, uh, Raj Nadekaduti, who's a colleague of mine at Michigan, has worked with uh, uh, Benyak George to, uh, on, on these types of chronic representations. And I think, okay. they, I think they have some. Uh, chronic or sum, I don't think there's anything. So that's another open problem. Yeah. <laughs> a chronic or product has, uh, ha I think there's uh, maybe the last two or three years, um, there's been work that's come out on that topic. Uh, you presented situations where the physics tells us how to decompose the large yeah. dimension. Uh, do you think that we, or do you have any example of uh, data in very large dimensions where you could a priori decide to split the dimension in uh, D1, D2, D3, mm -hmm. and then use this kind of Kronecker sum approach to estimate the covariance? What would happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's uh, it's a combinatorial problem. So it's another combinatorial problem. If you just given a, you're given a vector, right, and you're asked. I want to shape this vector into a tensor with compatible dimensions. What is the best uh, elements of, those vec of the vector placement uh, pattern to use, right? Um, I think that's wide open. Uh, I, I'm not aware of, any, um, of any, any methods to do that for large, k, for k greater than two. I mean, for, for, it's, it's a clustering problem, right, for, uh, for k equals 2. You have, a, you have a matrix, you want to find, uh, you know, similarities in that matrix that relate locality between elements uh, of the vector, I should say, of a vector. You want, to, you want to find a permutation of that vector into a matrix that will uh, yield a uh, minimum uh, norm in, in terms of uh, uh, closeness to some uh, say toplets form or, or sparse form uh, a matrix. That's that's uh, known. That, that's that's standard in Pitsianus van Loon uh, Kronecker product. Uh, for the Kronecker sum, I don't I don't I don't know the answer. And for uh, dimensions greater than k, I think that's a very, could be quite challenging, but a very good area to look at. Finding the right permutation of the indices. Do you think that the situations where you have, for example, two videos, mm -hmm. uh, like a kind of a stereo data, yeah. this uh, mm, mm, sum uh, can appear? When you two have videos? two videos? Yeah, yeah. Two, two parallel 
uh, where, uh, or two set yeah. of the data where they have one of the index uh, mm -hmm. in common, for example. I see what you're saying. Like. So may maybe, yeah, maybe you have two, two videos. One is imaging uh, in wavelength. The other one's in space. But they're both commonly indexed by time. That's an interesting, yeah. That, right, right. I mean, these models really are, are modeling the dependency structure, the covariance structure. So uh, you know, it's, it's not clear that just having two instruments right, that, that have this connection in one index is going to yield to the dependency structure having a, a similar type of dependence right, or similar type of structure as chronic or some. Uh, but it, but it's, uh, that's, that's an interesting um, example which is worth thinking about. Okay, so I think it's time to thank the speaker and fight for his talk. Thank you.